Now talk about the military in Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tank. We talk about the Honor of Flight program. This is really important with Meredith, Meredith Rosenbeck. She's the CEO of Honor of Flight, honorflight.org, Honor of Flight Inc., um, which is, uh, gee, it's got, it's got branches all over the country, but for now she's talking to us from Ohio. Uh, thank you for appearing, Meredith. Thank you for having me, Jay. Glad to be here. So what is Honor Flight? Talk to us about how it got organized, uh, what your role is, what it does. Absolutely. Honor Flight began in 2005. It was the brainchild of two um, amazing men, Earl Morris and Jeff Miller, um, who came together to form the Honor Flight Network in 2005. Their goal together was to bring World War II veterans to, at that time, the fairly new World War II Memorial. Um, and they both felt an urgency to do so because the World War II veterans at that time even were aging out um, and dying at a fast clip. In, and now we're, we're, we're still trying to serve our World War II veterans um, and knowing that they're aging out even faster at this point. Um, but the program grew from 2005 all the way to today. Our program is currently serving World War II, Korean War, Vietnam War veterans, and all of those in between. Um, we have to date served over 250,000 veterans with a cost-free trip to Washington, D.C. to visit their memorial. Um, in their day in Washington, D.C., our veterans visit the World War II Memorial, the Korean War Memorial, Vietnam Wall and Memorial. They typically go to Arlington National Cemetery, to the Air Force Memorial, Iwo Jima, which is the Marine Corps Memorial. Uh, they really get the whole gamut of a day in Washington, D.C. It is a day of honor. It's a day for them to share with each other stories and memories, good and bad. Um, and it's, it's really an honor for me to run this organization at a national level. Why do you do that? My grandfather was a World War II veteran. Uh, one of the highlights of his life was, was going back. He was a proud veteran. And one of the highlights of his life was going back to the World War II Memorial. And you know, having that opportunity to reminisce and think about his service and what he did for our country. Um, he just, his passion for his time in the military just inspired me to do this role. Um, there are challenges every single day. There are challenges we face as an organization, but I think that you know, his passion for being a veteran and my gratitude towards those who served for our country, like my grandfather, gets, keeps me going through all the days. It's fantastic. I just, love our mission it's so clear it's so wonderful um you know it's just the best job i could possibly ask for <laughs> so how how does somebody sign up to take an honor flight uh, i i'll make a guess and say they go to your website which is honorflight.org we'll show a picture of that soon enough okay. um and i guess they sign up and um and, and they have to qualify what do they have to do to qualify great question there is a ton of information available at honorflight.org. We have 130 regional hubs that are around the United States. You can find your link to your regional hub on our website. We have a map of all 50 states and you can click on your state and find your regional hub based on the airport that's nearest you. You can go to the regional hub website, find their application and apply. You have to have served during World War II, the Korean War, or Vietnam. You do not have to have served on foreign soil to qualify for an honor flight trip. It's military service, and our gratitude is all, all we're really looking for there. Each of our 130 hubs does, does their program just a little bit differently. From a national level, we set safety and operational standards for the organization at a baseline, and each hub gets to kind of modify that as they see fit to, to best serve the veterans in their area. So each hub's application is a little bit different. We also know that not every veteran lives near a local hub, regional hub. So we have a program that we run from our national office. We call it the Lone Eagle Honor Flight. And we serve those veterans who aren't near a regional hub, which is what we're going to be doing in Hawaii here in a couple of weeks. Hmm. We have those veterans go to our national website and pull our application and apply through our national website. If, there, if you're confused and you don't know where to go, your best bet is to go to the national website and apply through the national organization, and we will make sure that your application gets to the right place. So it's not too late 
for a veteran in Hawaii to sign up for the honor flight that's coming in a few weeks? That's correct. So the flight that's coming in a few weeks is, is nearly full. However, we are looking to create one of a, a hub, an actual honor flight hub in Hawaii to continue to bring Hawaiian based veterans to Washington, D.C. for their day of honor. So this is not a one and done situation for us. We hope to establish a long living program in Hawaii to bring those veterans to D.C. to visit their memorial. Mm, I'd support that. You know, we have a lot of veterans here from World War II and Korea and Vietnam for sure and thereafter. Um, a, lot, a lot of people have retired here because they like their service here and wanted to come back and live here and they are here. Yes, that's absolutely the case. And we, you know, the, when we initially announced a few months ago that we were going to be doing our inaugural flight from Hawaii with the support of Alaska Airlines, the, the, the feedback we received was tremendous. The veterans were so excited to hear that we would be running our program for them. They, you know, the guardians were ready to go. I mean, we've had so many volunteers already looking to volunteer with the program in Hawaii. It's been amazing. Well, I want to talk about age for a minute. Okay? If I was a veteran World War II, the greatest generation, the greatest generation uh, that, we, that we have any contact with, uh, I would be 80 or 90 years old now. And there's, there's a fair chance I would be infirm in one way or another. Um, if I was a, a veteran from, say, Korea, it would be, you know, 10 years younger, maybe. And I would likewise have the possibility of being infirm. If I was a Vietnam veteran, and I am personally, um, I mean, Vietnam era, let me put it that way, um, I, would, I would be still, I would be in my, my, my 70s anyway, or older. And I would have the chance, the possibility of being infirm. How do you deal with that? Do you say, no, you can't come? You say, we'll make special arrangements. We'll accommodate you. Um, we'll be very careful about your, your health and, uh, you know, your, your status, so to speak, um, you know, and your strength, whatnot, will take care of you, even if your infirmity appears on, on the program, on the flight. Uh, that's a great question, Jay. Yes, we take every veteran, regardless of any infirmities they might have or health challenges they might have, as long as their doctor is okay with them making the trip. Um, we will make sure to coordinate that veteran with a guardian. Um, those, are our, those are our volunteers that come along with our veterans to help care for them throughout the trip, help not necessarily a nurse or a doctor, but someone who can be with the veteran throughout the trip, making sure that they have water and, and are taking their medicine. We have a health questionnaire that we bring along to make sure we know if veterans have any special health needs. We have, you know, we do, we, we've taken the gamut of veterans. In fact, our Lone Eagle program uh, takes terminally ill veterans as well. And so we have dealt with everything from um, terminal lung cancer uh, patients who you know, are in the last few weeks of their life to, you know, um, oxygen needs, we need oxygen needs, wheelchairs, all of the things. So, you know, any infirmity you might have shouldn't dissuade you from applying to go on an honor flight trip. That's a once in a lifetime thing. Yeah. So suppose Great. I apply to you for an honor flight every year. Can I, can I do that? <laughs> can I do it Good on try. a repeated basis? <laughs> <laughs> like you said, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. It's a it's a one time trip, um, but it we will try. We always try to prioritize our veterans based on age. So we try to get our World War II veterans on the flight first, followed by Korea, followed by Vietnam, and then if there are terminally ill veterans who've served during any period of time, we prioritize them as well in terms of our waiting list. And so, you know, there is some movement there in terms of waiting list and and how we get people on flight. But we want to make sure those are those who have the least amount of, of opportunity left. We, we try to get them there as soon as possible because it is a once in a lifetime chance to go see the memorial. So you have a special arrangement for for eras um, uh, periods after Vietnam if they've been uh, handicapped, uh, injured, right? If they have some really profound medical situation which they you know gained in in, in wartime. Uh, how does that work? Yeah, so that's through our national program, and 
those veterans apply just like any other veteran through the Lone Eagle program. And we offer a TLC opportunity for those veterans. So it's just based on, you know, their, their condition and, you know, their, their expected life expectancy um, to get them on a trip as soon as possible so that they don't miss the opportunity. Soon enough, I suppose, uh, you'll have fewer of the World War II veterans and um, you, you'll, you'll, move the, you'll move the frame ahead uh, into Gulf War one and two and so forth, right? And then, uh, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan and all that. So what, what's your plan on that? What, what's the time frame? The two memorials, the War on Terror Memorial, and I, I'm trying to make sure I get the names right because I, I don't know if I will. The War on Terror Memorial and the Desert Storm Desert Shield Memorial are both approved and in the process of continuing the fundraising to get the memorials underway. Once those memorials are established and dedicated, and we have actually gotten through enough of our Vietnam veteran waiting list because we don't want to, we, we want to continue to prioritize our, our, our oldest veterans first because we want them to have the opportunity to see their memorial. We will then open it up to those veterans, absolutely. So it was interesting, Jay, because when I took this job about four and a half years ago now, um, I had a good friend who said to me, why would you take that job? And I, was, I looked at him, I was like, well, it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity. I'm really excited about it. And he goes, but World War II veterans, they're all going to be gone in a couple of years. And then what are you going to do? And I said, oh, no, we're already serving Korean War veterans and Vietnam veterans. And then we're going to move into some of the more recent conflicts, Desert Storm, Desert Shield, War on Terror, all of those conflicts, because those veterans also deserve their day of honor. And so it's interesting because I always just assume everyone knows that we're going to continue our program as long as we absolutely can and as long as we have the support of our generous public uh, to keep our program going. Because like I said, all of our honored veterans fly for free. Um, and it, these trips are, are expensive. I mean, we, we fundraise for these trips and we bring all of these veterans in so that they don't have to pay a dime. As long as we can continue the fundraising effort, we will continue our program until I'm old and gray, I guess. <laughs> and then I think someone else will probably take my place. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> can't stay forever. So, uh, yeah, I wanted to ask you about the trip. So you mentioned Alaska Airlines. That's a long flight. It's not like you can fly from um, Hawaii or the West Coast um, to Washington to see these memorials and have these events uh, without staying over. And I suspect there's got to be a hotel in there somewhere uh, and sure. meals in there somewhere. and transportation in there somewhere. How do you how do you organize that? Because that, as you said, can be expensive. The massive effort in terms of both logistics and planning and fundraising. And so with, with respect to this Hawaii trip, it's actually going to be a five-day trip. They mm. will leave Hawaii on Monday, May 7th. I'm looking at kind of looking over my calendar to make sure I get the dates right. They will fly to Portland, spend a night, they will get to DC. Um, the evening of Tuesday the 8th, they will do their tour in DC on Wednesday the 9th, go back to Portland on Thursday the 10th, and then come back to Honolulu for their welcome home on Veterans Day, November 11th. Um, so it will be a five day trip to just get everyone there, get the tour in, and then get everyone back. So, just in terms of the experience that I would have on an honor flight, I would I take the flight together with people who have also signed up from my my hub, my group, and we would fly together. Um, and and then you would bus me to a hotel or a restaurant or a combination. Uh, and then you would bus me to these various memorials around Washington and give me a tour in each one of them. Uh, somebody's going to have to do that. And, um, and uh, I guess uh, spend a little time with me in some reception. So I can get to know the fellow next to me, right? Tell me how it works. What What is the experience like once I get on that plane? You hit the nail on the head. I couldn't have done it better if I tried. Um, the, you will fly to the airport. Or you will get yourself to the airport. You will fly to Portland, the hotel. There will be food, accommodations, um, and you know there will be some time for you to visit with those other veterans that are on the flight. Guardians will also be traveling along. So. 
veterans will have someone with them for this entire five day period. Um, get back on, get, get up in the morning, get back to the airport on another flight, get to DC to the airport. You'll be at, a, at an airport in DC. You'll spend the, the evening again. You'll have dinner and do all the things, hop on a bus the next day, guided tours of each of the memorials as you go around DC. Um, and there's plenty of time. I think that's the one thing that, that I love the most about our, our honor plate trip. We make sure that, that not only are you getting to see the memorials, there's time for the veterans to reflect and share while they're at the memorials. Because if you've ever been to them, they are moving in and of themselves. And when you have the opportunity to visit them with veterans, um, I, I love to go. I don't often go because I don't want to take a veteran's seat on any flight. Uh, but if I happen to be in D.C. for meetings or whatever, I always try to go if I know a hub will be in town because veterans love to share their stories and I love to hear them because it's part of history and we get to carry that along with us. Um, and it's such an amazing day. Everyone has such a it's healing. It's just you can't describe the day until you go. Oh, wow. You know, you just opened a thought for me. And that is, yes, it is part of history. And, and these are stories that nobody may know about, you know, they're, they're personal stories. Uh, and it's great that um, these, these um, veterans can share the stories, but poof, it's gone. And uh, the question is, how can you memorialize that? And I have an answer for you. You can send them to me. I will memorialize, I will be happy to memorialize them having these conversations, if they're willing, and, and yeah, put it on Think Tech Hawaii. One of the best parts about my job, and the thing that's the most rewarding is we often get letters or emails from families when veterans return home from their honor flight trip. And they say, dad or, or grandpa or grandma or whomever the veteran was that went on their trip, they never told us anything about their time in the military. Not one story about their service. It was bottled up and put on a shelf and never asked about, never spoken about. They went on their honor flight trip. They had an opportunity to be with other veterans with similar experiences. And now they came home and they finally told us their story. And for me, that for me is not just leaving that story untold because now the family knows. And that's where the history gets continued because now grandchildren can be told about what grandpa did when he served in the military. And before the honor flight trip, it's incredible how often we get that from families. And, it, and it's just so moving that this trip just allows that opportunity then within that family to share the story. Why, I'm sure you've thought about this, but why in the first phase is it bottled up? What's, what's the scenario that makes these guys and girls uh, these veterans bottle it up for so many years. Uh, what What is the psychological process there? I think often it's trauma. I think one of the things I, I've seen with our Vietnam veterans, and I'm, I'm not a medical practitioner or anything like that, but one of the things I've seen with our Vietnam veterans that I've had the opportunity to spend some time with on their trip, they often think they themselves didn't do enough. There was always someone else who did more or risked more and they don't feel deserving of the ability to tell their story or of that story being memorialized and I hear it all too often because you know and, and as the day goes on and, and you know the stories are worked through and and people talk together eventually I, I think that those folks do feel deserving that their story does deserve to be told because others have similar stories or similar experiences or shared like experiences. You know, often it's the World War II veterans who get our Vietnam veterans to open up. And I think that's really incredible because those, the, the experiences were very different, but similar in so many ways. And it, and it allows everyone to kind of just be able to open those floodgates that have been closed for so long. It's really, it, it's truly amazed me over the years how often that comes up. I'm, I'm still making you the offer. <laughs> I'll take you up on it. Well, anytime I find someone, I'll send them your way. Okay. You know, when I looked at your website and I, I try to imagine to ideate how this was, I thought, um, gee, wouldn't it be something if these veterans knew each other to start? 
uh, and they could talk about their their common experience in a in a given military unit or some geographical location, some battle, who knows what. Uh, wouldn't that be wonderful? And wouldn't that be, you know, the most intense possible thing you could have, especially given the fact that they may not have talked for, you know, 50, 60, 70 years, as a matter of fact. But then, you know, talking to you now, I realize that it doesn't matter if they knew the other veteran before. It's the fact that the other veteran in the seat next to them, um, in the in the plane, in the bus, in the hotel, in the restaurant, at the um, at at the event, in the in the memorial, um, is somebody who can understand what Absolutely. their experience was, and that's enough. In fact, it's actually even preferable. Uh, I I don't need to talk to somebody who was there shoulder to shoulder with me. That's that's nice. I want to talk to a number of people who can understand what happened to me. Yep, I think you're exactly right on that, Jay. I think different experiences allow people to, to sh because they don't, you know, a Vietnam veteran doesn't know what the beaches of Normandy were like, and, and, but they can then, you know, hear that story and say, well, oh, I did, I did this, or, or I went through this and saw this, and it's telling it to someone who hasn't been there, who's interested in the differences, right? Or interested in the different story um, that someone else has to tell. And I think that the commonality of having served our country um, brings it all together. And it, and it really, we always find it, that our veterans are just more than willing by the end of the day to just share their stories with each other and with their guardian and with, you know, with the folks on their trip. Yeah, well, there's, there's another part of that story. It's the story of catching up. So here I was, I served with you or with somebody like you in World War II or in Vietnam or Korea. Um, but my, my life has moved forward from there. I came back, I was married, I had kids, I family, career, I mean, or, or the lack of those things. You know, the, the, the track of life uh, for the veteran. Veteran by definition is someone who uh, is still alive. A veteran is somebody who served in a, in, a, in a theater of war. And a veteran is somebody who had a life in the country when he or she got back. And I am sure to a moral certainty, and you can confirm this for me, that part of their conversation on the plane, on the bus, uh, in the events at the memorials, the restaurants, the hotels, is about what happened after they got back, what kind of lives they've had. And for that matter, how their military experience affected those lives, you know, the step going forward. Am I right? Absolutely. There is so much sharing about children and what they've done and in marriage and family and, and things that they've been through post-war. And I think that that sort of, those commonalities and the ability to share some of those day-to-day -day things allows them then you get a little deeper, right? So you sit next to somebody on the bus and you start talking, oh, I've been married for you know, 40 years and my wife does this and I have, you know, this many kids. And it just gets, as the day goes on, you kind of get deeper and deeper. And as you see the memorials and, you know, you, you get to experience that with, you know, you might be an army guy and you go to the Marine Corps Memorial, but maybe that experience brings up some memories for the, the buddy next to you who's been in, was in the Marine Corps. And so it's just all the different pieces and parts come together. Um, you know, we have something we call honor flight magic day. And it happens from time to time. And we also have this thing called honor flight allergies. You know, they, they flare up from time to time and you tear up a little bit, but it, it, you know, it goes away. Um, but the honor flight magic piece is interesting. We've had so many instances where veterans who served together in wartime have been on separate honor flight trips from different parts of the country came into DC on the same day, it just happens to be the same day, and recognize each other at the memorial and can then talk, have a conversation. They, they, it, it's truly incredible. It's happened on many occasions. Or, you know, um, run into someone that, you know, is the son of someone who they served with and that that person's a guardian on their trip. It's just really incredible how you can watch how people come together and the, you know, I think now it used to be seven degrees of separation, but I think now what is it four because of the internet, right? I think. Yeah, sure. But it's, yeah. it's interesting how it, how it comes together on an honor plate trip sometimes just 
the, the strange little things that the universe has kind of manufactured. Well, that's why it's such a gift, it. isn't it? It is. So, so do they, do they, do they, do they get reconnected? Um, I, I may not know this individual, but I had such a time talking to him or her. So when I get home, maybe I want to send him an email. I want to continue that conversation. After all, it was an important part of my life and my survival and the years after um, that I am a veteran. Um, do you find that? Do you find that they bond up where they did not know each other before? Or maybe they did. And now, you know, that relationship continues after the honor fight. We do. And many of our hubs will do reunion luncheons. And so once a year, they'll get everyone that went that year together and, and do a luncheon and have a speaker or, you know, or just bring people together. Um, some of them will have, you know, guardians reach out and help the veterans get together. Many of our veterans are in you know, assisted living or independent living facilities. And so we have a lot of our volunteers who are more than willing to go help our veterans meet back up with those folks that they met on their trip. And so they'll take them, go pick them both up and take them to lunch and have a day of it. Um, and so I do, I do think people do stay connected after their trip um, if they want to. And if they don't want to, that's, you know, quite fine as well. We don't share information unless we're asked to, you know, by the both parties that, that it's that's okay fair. to share information. Um, but we do find that our veterans do like to stay connected after the trip with those that they went on the trip with and with the guardians as well, because it's a special day for everyone. You know, I'm, I'm thinking if I spent five days with a bunch of guys, uh, Hither and Jan, and sort of a swirling community of people where I run into this person and I rub elbows with that person and so forth, um, there are a lot of things to talk about. And one of them is, is, is the fundamental among all veterans, and that is uh, intense patriotism. They have, in a way, they have invested their lives in the country. Um, and by and large, I would expect that veterans are more patriotic than the average citizen on the street. Um, and so they must talk about that. On the other hand, you know, the conversation isn't always going to be the same from generation to generation. Their view of patriotism, their view of their relationship with the country would be different, I think, from World War II um, to Vietnam. A lot of people opposed Vietnam. Even in the military, they opposed Vietnam. Uh, <laughs> and Korea, uh, Korea is in the middle somewhere. Um, and, and of course, more recently, and I, I don't know if you see this yet, but uh, I, think, I think the veterans may have a different view of patriotism now. We know there are a lot of people on active duty, you know, who um, are not as patriotic as we might be, given the div divisiveness in the country right now. Uh, they may side with, um, you know, people who are arguably not democratic. They may have a different view of it entirely, um, however ill-advised that may be. And I just wonder if the conversation uh, in the airplane, in the bus, in the hotel, in the restaurant, at the memorial includes the level of patriotism that they take away from their investment in the country during their years of service. I'm probably not party to those particular conversations because we let our kind of veterans have their own time and, and their own, you know, conversations with each other at the dinner. So we, you know, we try to let them have time to share their stories, to share their ideas and, and, and enjoy each other because that's part of the trip is is honoring and celebrating them but also giving them the time to honor and celebrate themselves and, and with each other right and that camaraderie but i you know i i do think that we do see i don't know that it's patriotism but we see different views in in terms of how people felt about their service. like i know my grandfather really felt proud of his service it was something, you know, he wore his, his, his Legion hat with pride, his World War II veteran hat with pride all the time, everywhere. But we have, I know we have some of our Vietnam veterans who still don't have pride for their service because they just felt like it was, you know, a political, there, there, was, there was so many politics surrounding that war. Um, and I, I want them to, to be proud of their service, though, because they sacrificed for our country. And they deserve to be honored for that sacrifice, you know, and, and I just don't want them ever to be ashamed of their service. And I, you know, sometimes we do see that, 
Um, and I just hope that, that we can help help get people past that and be able to share with their families, you know, what their service meant to them, maybe at the time and maybe what it means now, because at that time it could have meant one thing and today it could mean to something totally different to them. And so, you know, that sharing of that conversation with, with their families or with, with those on the honor flight trip, I just think it's important to like, to the healing, getting past, you know, the, the feelings of, of not even wanting to talk about your service. Well, you know, one thing is clear that um, a strong country requires dedication by the members of the military and the community um, to be dedicated to the members of the military, um, you know, to be on the same page. And, um, and just like the Veterans Administration, just like, you know, the ordinary citizen who makes contributions to you, who supports this program, um, this is a statement that we care. And it's not only a message to the people who go on the honor flag. It's a message um, to the people who might be in the military today or tomorrow, or the people who might never be in the military, um, to say that we are together in this matter uh, and agree. that we care about the, the men and women in uniform. So I think it goes beyond just um, the, the, the veterans on those planes that you organize. It's a statement that goes far broader than that. That's my feeling. What's your feeling? I completely agree, Jay. And we have so many active duty military who are in the DC area, in the Annapolis, Maryland area, in the DC area. And they love to come out in uniform and greet our veterans at the memorial, to greet our buses as they drive by, to salute our veterans as they as they drive through the memorials. It's truly incredible to see, but I think it does it does show by honoring our veterans from World War II through Vietnam. I, I think it does show that we care for our veterans and we we care about that service so much. And I our veterans love when our active duty military come out to see them. I mean, it's just such a great experience for them to share, to just, you know, just reminisce and, and, and remember what it was like to wear the uniform. It's really neat to see because it, they really do light up when our, when our young military folks come out to greet them and, and talk with them. Do they ever wear their own uniforms? Not usually. Um, we I'll, I'll tell you, I would, I would wear my own uniform, except <laughs> I want to be clear about this. It would never fit me. <laughs> we have a couple who have fit back into it. I think that's usually half the battle is that it doesn't quite fit anymore. You're not you know, quite the same size as you were back in the military days. Um, but we've had a couple who have fit into them. But it is neat sometimes to see some of our veterans will, will have the opportunity with their guardian to show them some of their memorabilia or photo books or, you know, things that they've collected through their service. And, you know, some of them have brought it out for the first time, you know, in 40 years and, and they bring it out and it's just like, wow, this is, you know, truly an incredible piece of memorabilia. Um, and so we love to see that. I, I love when, when our veterans are able to share that with their guardians or maybe bring it to the luncheon or, you know, any of those kinds of things. It's really neat. Some of the stuff that they have is, is pretty cool. Yeah. So, um, some people who watch this um, may not know about you. Um, maybe they're learning about it right now as they watch. Some people who watch this um, might be inclined to make a contribution to you. Uh, can you take a moment and just leave your final thoughts with them about this? Absolutely. Um, we are always, we always are grateful for monetary donations. And you can make a monetary donation on our website at honorflight.org. But we're also always looking for volunteers to come out. If you're interested in volunteering, you can find your regional hub on our website. And you can contact your regional hub director from that website. Their email is on there. Their phone number is on there. We are always looking for folks to come out to the airports to greet our veterans when they arrive home from their honor flight trip. That is truly an amazing experience. You can bring your kids to that. It's truly, I, I always say, we are one of the few organizations left where you can actually come out and volunteer. Like you can actually give your time um, and volunteer and you can bring your kids along because it's a kid friendly event. Bring them out to the welcome home. Uh, sometimes they get a little late at night. So you wanna make sure to check the time 
Um, but we have Boy Scout troops and Girl Scout troops who come out, especially during the summertime, um, because, you know, there's no school the next day or, you know, it's, it's kind of can be a late night sometimes. But it's, it's great. They make, they make signs and they, you know, they come out with their parents and they wave flags. And it's just, it's really impactful for our veterans who come home as part of their celebration, part of that day of honor for them. But it's really, really nice. So if you want to volunteer, you can check out Find Your Regional Hub on our website and, and contact them to volunteer. You can also make a donation to your regional hub. Um, so if you click on through our website, you can find your regional hub and make a donation to your regional hub as well. Um, we are always, you know, all of our veterans buy for free. I would say the cost of a trip has gone up significantly, um, at least since COVID. For, for a veteran that's east of the Mississippi, the trip for that veteran is around $650 to $750. For a veteran west of the Mississippi, that's probably around $1,350 to $1,500. And from Alaska and Hawaii, it's, it's significantly more than that. And so your contributions go directly to our veterans. Uh, we, we have you know, a small staff that runs a great program, uh, but 95% of our dollars go back to getting our veterans to DC. You know, it, it occurred to me looking at your website, but it occurs to me now that this whole program is not only celebrating the veterans who are still alive, you're also honoring. Yeah. Well, thank you, Meredith. Great to talk to you. Really Wonderful appreciate you joining us on the show and helping us understand not only what you know, uh, Honor Flight does, um, but what it represents. This is a very important part of our national heritage and our patriotism. Thank you so much. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.